So I'm going to tell you about some research we're doing at Mount Sinai, um, also on habituation, uh, using a psychophysiological uh, approach called startle, eye blink, affective startle modulation. So we know, and actually I'm going to qualify myself, I'm actually one of those non-clinicians here and I'm really enjoying this meeting and I do want to thank Mary and the program committee. I've actually learned a lot. Um, I'm really a cognitive neuroscientist, so, but I do study borderline personality disorder with my colleagues at Mount Sinai, so I'm, I'm telling you things that you already know, so you're going to have to forgive me. We know that borderline personality disorder um, has a high suicide rate, and we know that patients with borderline PD utilize more mental health resources than individuals with other psychiatric disorders. And we also know from work such as the work that Harold just presented, that they do show an excessive reaction to emotional stimuli. So I think it's important to understand the core psychological processes that underlie the features of borderline personality disorder that lead to negative outcomes. And I'm trying to do this using some psychophysiological techniques. We know that affective instability, as Harold just reminded us, is the most prevalent and enduring diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder. And it's also the most enduring over time, as you can see from this landmark study by McGlashan et al. It's at the top of the list here, and it follow up affective instabilities at the top of the list in borderline personality disorder. So how do we define emotion dysregulation? Well, from a psychophysiological perspective, the work of Marshall Linehan is really perfect. So, Emotional dysregulation is defined or characterized by an inability to regulate emotional responses with a high sensitivity to emotional stimuli, and those could be unpleasant or pleasant, and an unusually strong and long-lasting reaction. So if we imagine for a moment that we have an emotional stimulus, in this case, let's say that it's an unpleasant stimulus, in healthy individuals, if we're looking at a psychophysiological response, such as the startle eye blink response, which I'm gonna tell you about in a few moments, we would see a response to that stimulus. So here's our healthy control response. In borderline personality disorder, we would imagine that that response would be a higher amplitude, a higher peak, and that it also might have a slower recovery down to baseline. Additionally, if we presented that emotional stimulus again and repeated it, in healthy individuals, we would imagine a decrement in the amplitude of that response, as Harold just, talk, just discussed and Marianne uh, talked about yesterday, post-DBT uh, treatment. Whereas in BPD patients, we might imagine that they would show a greater amplitude or deficient habituation in processing this emotional stimulus. So deficient habituation to repeated stimuli, as per Marshall and Hans really nice conceptual model. So we first looked at this, similar to Harold's work presented today, we looked at this, as Marianne talked about yesterday briefly, uh, in the fMRI environment using uh, these international affective picture show pictures, which are all rated, and there's a manual. Some people use manualized treatments, I use manualized pictures uh, in my experiments. So we repeated the pictures in the magnet. Um, they were presented for six seconds. Um, and this allowed us to look at the bold response to repeated picture processing. We also told the patients and the healthy controls in the study to think about the meaning of the pictures for them personally, and I also do want to add in that we use social pictures, because we know that that's important in studying borderline personality disorder. Um, additionally, the little icon there that you see, the little noise, or, excuse me, sorry about that, the little um, speaker, is reminding me to tell you that we actually, on, on half the trials, presented a very brief burst of static. But the idea here is that I was trying to make this fMRI experiment as similar to what I do in the psychophysiology lab as possible. Um, it turns out that the little noise burst really didn't affect the um, fMRI data, but as we're going to get to, it does affect psychophysiology data. Um, so in the fMRI experiment, we traced the amygdala in each of the participants blind to diagnosis, which was a very heroic effort by one of my graduate students and we co-registered it to their bold response. And Marianne showed this data yesterday, I'm just gonna remind you about it. What we saw is overall, averaged over all the picture types, the BPD patients 
showed a delay in their um, response coming back down to baseline, and that you can see with the green arrow. Additionally, uh, when we broke out the um, trials into novel and repeat, as Harold just talked about, we saw an increase in the amygdala response. I'm focusing on the amygdala. I, I apologize, I am very amygdala-centric. I'm gonna get to why I think that's important a little later, um, because it's very translational, and animal models often look at the amygdala. So here we are showing you that um, a bigger response in the BPD patients to repeated uh, pictures, and that's, this is averaged over all the picture types. However, it's important to know that two-thirds of them were the emotional pictures, the pleasant and the unpleasant pictures. One-third of them were novel. If we further parse it out into unpleasant, neutral, and pleasant types of pictures, we see with the blue arrows that really the, the effect here is that the borderline patients show an increased amygdala response to both unpleasant and pleasant pictures. And interestingly, these pictures are matched on arousal level, they're highly arousing, um, and they differ from the neutral pictures, which are low on arousal. So this suggests that the BPD patients have an overall arousal deficit, not a valence deficit in this case, because they're showing this uh, abnormal habituation to both unpleasant and pleasant stimuli. Here's a brain picture for those of you that like brain pictures, showing you, and, and actually John Gunderson, I hope he's still here, should like this because this shows the specificity of this effect. It, it's, the amygdala is higher to repeated unpleasant pictures in BPD, but not in, in patients that have schizotypal personality disorder. So some specificity. Uh, interestingly, when we look at their self-report, they rate the pictures on a nine-point scale. Um, and we find something similar to what Jill Hooley presented yesterday. We find a mismatch between what they say about how the pictures made them feel and what their amygdala was telling us. So their amygdala is jacked up, but on self-report, they're showing a blunted response. As you see on the left here, the um, BPD patients are lower in, in saying that the, the pictures really weren't that bad compared to healthy controls. Similarly, they think that the pleasant pictures on the right side are more unpleasant compared to the healthy controls. So a dissociation between their physiology and their self-report, which is consistent with this idea of alexithymia. So now we're gonna to turn to psychophysiology, and I'm gonna to try to be a little bit of a salesperson here. I'm gonna tell you why I think psychophysiology is really cool. So some of the advantages of psychophysiology are that it's very easy to record in clinical populations. So here is actually a happy research assistant in our lab who's now in graduate school, showing how we put these little recording discs under the eye, one goes behind the ear, and they sit in a nice quiet room and they see these pictures on a computer screen. The experimenter's outside the room, but keeping a close eye on them. Secondly, it, psychophysiology, or affective startle in this case, is a great way to get a nonverbal, very objective measure of emotion. We're not asking them anything, we're just simply having them experience this paradigm, we do actually afterwards ask them to rate the pictures. They view them again and they rate them. This shows you how we record um, non-invasively. We put these recording discs under their eye. We record from the abicularis lagli muscle and we're not asking them anything. Mapping this on now to Peter Lang's theory or model about biphasic emotions, what happens here is when you see an unpleasant picture, which is the very top stimulus, and five seconds into this unpleasant picture, we present a very brief burst of static through some headphones, 50 milliseconds, 100 decibels, it sounds like a click. We elicit a blink response, which is part of the whole body startle response. And we get a rather large amplitude on this blink response. So according to Lang's model, this is an aversive defensive emotion. It's um, an unpleasant picture, and superimposed on that, it's sort of an aversive startle stimulus. So, the blink is enhanced. In contrast to that, if you're looking at a pleasant picture and you present the startle uh, probe, you see an inhibited response. This is appetitive or appetitive emotion. The startle response is diminished because in this case you have a pleasant experience and you're presenting the unpleasant startle acoustic probe and it's diminished in terms of your physiological response. And the um, response to the neutral pictures is intermediate. This has been shown in labs across the country, really thousands of um, experiments a lot with Psych 100 students. You get this beautiful stepwise pattern. 
with big amplitude to unpleasant stimuli, small amplitude to pleasant, and neutral being intermediate. Another great advantage of this affective startle is that it's translational. So everybody that's a mammal shows the startle response, making it nice to translate across animal and human models. Here you see the armadillo jumping up in the air from the National Geographic photographer's flash. Um, in humans, we often are startled physically and show the whole body startle. Uh, so in rats, we record this, um, actually others record this, using a potentiometer and measuring whole body startle, and in humans, we use the eye blink component. Um, very quickly, the startle pathway itself is a very basic pathway that I'm not particularly interested in, but what's of interest to us in terms of studying emotion is that it's regulated or modulated by the amygdala. So the amygdala has a top-down influence on the brainstem, modulating um, the amplitude of the blink response in this case. So increased amygdala activation leads to enhanced startle response. Lastly, affective startle is a potential biological end of phenotype. Um, it's also perhaps a, a good adjunct, I'm gonna try to convince you today for maybe looking at patients pre and post therapy as Marianne Goodman is doing. So the startle paradigm is very similar to the fMRI paradigm I showed you a few minutes ago. Um, pictures are presented and the little gray arrows that you see, um, I don't have a pointer, I apologize, um, are the startle probes that are presented sometimes during the pictures and sometimes in, or in between the pictures and we measure the amplitude of the blink response. Uh, so I'm going to present some data on a sample of 30 healthy controls, 35 patients with borderline personality, and 26 patients with schizotypal personality disorder. Um, they were matched on demographics. Um, we were very rigorous about diagnosing them in the, in the Mood and PD group with Larry Seaver and Antonia New. Um, here's a little bit about their, um, some of their self-reports. I realized this morning when I was looking at the slide that the healthy controls here have a high STI, STAI score, looking like they're anxious. I mean, they are New Yorkers, but I think that could be a typo. I'm gonna have to check that before I submit this paper. <laughs> um, but basically, the borderline patients couldn't have more than three SPD traits, and the um, SPDs couldn't have more than three BPD traits. Um, in many ways, the, the schizotypals are sort of opposite. Harold uses uh, avoidant personality disorder as a control, a psychiatric control group. In this case, I use schizotypal personality disorder because I'm actually interested in schizophrenia spectrum disorders as well. Um, so you can see here that the BPD patients were higher than the other groups on affective lability and impulsivity, which is not unexpected. So our hypotheses were that consistent with prior work and Marshall Linehan's concept of emotion regulation, um, that we would see that the BPD patients would show exaggerated affective startle during unpleasant social pictures, and they would show significantly slower habituation to unpleasant pictures. Uh, we did a, a, a nice um, multi-model uh, MANOVA here, looking at the groups and looking at some repeated measures. And what did we find? Basically, um, you can see on the left side that the BPD patients showed exaggerated amplitude of their startled blink response during the unpleasant pictures compared to the other two groups. Uh, and they didn't differ from, from the other groups um, on neutral or pleasant pictures. When we looked at this, um, because we had an interaction with trial block, and we looked at this over time, we saw that where, where the blue arrow is, that the BPD patients actually show this effect primarily on the later part of the um, trials. So they actually go up in terms of their blink amplitude over time after they're continuing to see these unpleasant pictures. And this was not seen for neutral or pleasant pictures. When we look at their self-report, similar to the fMRI experiment that I told you about earlier, we see a mismatch. So while their startle blink response, which is linked to their amygdala, is high, their self-report is that the unpleasant pictures aren't really that bad compared to the healthy controls. So a dissociation, again, between their physiology and their self-report. This is similar to work I did a few years ago using a really nice word list I got from Jill Hooley, who did a directed forgetting paradigm. So these were unpleasant, borderline salient words like alone, suicidal, ugly. They, they viewed the words on the computer and had to think about the meaning for them personally. 
Uh, we saw exaggerated affective startle during the unpleasant words in borderlines compared to healthy controls, but no differences for neutral words. And on the bottom graph, you see there that we saw this mismatch with their self-report. While their startle response was bigger to the unpleasant words, they said that they weren't really that bad in thinking about them. This work is similar and um, really um, is replicating some recent work done by Limburg and Hamm in Germany, uh, where they show that BPD patients show exaggerated startle during um, scripts that have a theme of rejection and abandonment compared to just kind of general unpleasant scripts, which is very interesting, speaking to this idea that this is a very cue-specific kind of deficit that we see in the BPD patients. Similarly, when, when uh, Lindbergh parses out her groups and looks at, you might, because you might well be thinking that this is related to PTSD, here's evidence showing us that really it's in the borderline patients that have no PTSD that this abnormality, this exaggerated startle response, which is linked to the amygdala, is observed during, in this case, ideographic, personalized scripts about unpleasant experiences compared to generally unpleasant neutral or pleasant scripts. We've begun to sort of look at individual differences in terms of affective startle, given some work by Ebner Primer in Germany showing that dissociative symptoms are related to this affective startle abnormality and borderline personality disorder. And interestingly, what we see is that it's the borderline patients that have low uh, dissociative experiences on the DES scale that are showing this exaggerated affective startle response, interestingly, and it's not the patients who are highly dissociated. So for the clinicians in the audience, I'm sure this makes a lot of sense. So just to summarize what I've told you today, consistent with a core clinical feature of BPD, these findings provide some objective measured psychophysiological evidence um, from affective startle and amygdala of exaggerated emotional processing and borderline personality disorder. These findings extend prior work by indicating that excessive affective startle in BPD is specific to unpleasant but not pleasant pictures. Um, however, the excessive amygdala activation is observed for both unpleasant and pleasant pictures. So I'm actually grappling with this as I'm trying to submit my affective startle data, which doesn't quite replicate my amygdala findings. Uh, in contrast to psychophysiology on self-report measures, BPD patients rated unpleasant pictures as being more pleasant and pleasant pictures as being more unpleasant compared to the healthy controls. This is consistent with prior work done by Antonia New and others, suggesting that BPD patients have trouble perceiving their own emotions, both the bad and the good ones. And lastly, in support of the concept of specificity, the observed BPD-related emotion processing abnormalities are not observed in schizotypal personality disorder. So I would like to conclude by saying affective startle and the underlying amygdala, amygdala abnormalities that we see are consistent with Linehan's concept of emotion dysregulation, which is an in inability to regulate emotional responses characterized by high sensitivity to emotional stimuli and unusually strong and long-lasting reactions. And our findings suggest that affective startle, this is the sales pitch, may be a useful adjunct to self-report for assessment of emotion processing, dysregulation, and treatment outcome. And it's a promising potential biological endophenotype for emotion dysregulation. Um, looking ahead, actually the future came before the present yesterday because Marianne presented where I think this should go, which is really looking at biological predictors of treatment response using psychophysiology and perhaps the amygdala-centric approach of looking at the amygdala and habituation. Thank you. I want to thank my collaborators, too, uh, many of which are here, Marianne and Antonia and Mercedes, and also um, some support, always useful. <laughs>